greetings, my friend. You are interested in the unknown, the mysterious, the unexplainable. That is why you are here. Yeah, it was my first, first production design job. Tim called me. He goes, you got to do this movie. You got to do this movie. Um, he he'd ha hired somebody, but it wasn't working out. Of course, I didn't sleep again for the next month. It was I hit the ground running. We had sets shooting like in the next couple of days that weren't done, and, and it was the, the art department was in chaos. The biggest challenge for me that I, is that I'd never done a black and white movie before, and that was a, the big challenge because I really didn't know how to do it. I talked to people that had done black and white movies. How do you do black and white movies? And basically, there's two ways that they talked about doing. Um, you paint the sets in shades of gray because, as I said before, the, the uh, contrast is the most important thing I found in doing a black and white film. So things don't just fade out or blend in. You got to keep contrast in mind. Um, and then I talked to people, said, no, do it in color. Just, just be, be aware of how the colors react to uh, uh, black and white film. So I bought a Polaroid, a little Polaroid camera and a mile of uh, black and white film. And every set, every color sample, I shot in black and white. So I could see, I had, a, had rows of, of uh, little pictures of uh, Polaroids and, and all the different colors and stuff. So I could pick something, I could, I could see what would go together. Uh, the lights and the dark. Red is the only color that goes weird. It can go dark or it can go light in black and white. So I kind of stayed away from red. Everything else was greens, yellows, grays, blacks. I mean, things you can count on. I mean, I can't see the difference. I'm colorblind. But I kind of like the dark gray one. Well, in every movie, I do a book. It's, I bind it. It um, basically has the whole movie in it. This is the inspiration for the f first house at the beginning of the movie. This is very Italianate, very Gothic. The other one I did, picked is a little simpler. This is a sketch for the, the opening where, he, where Jeffrey Jones sits up and the camera goes through the window in the lightning flash. These are Xeroxes of sketches, so they were, they were much bigger and a little bit nicer than these, but this is what I could squeeze into the book. This is a sketch for the original Hollywood model. We, we wanted a really kind of cool 50s model of Hollywood, but to do Hollywood in, you know, in the 50s, there's these certain icons, the Max Factor building, uh, the Warner Theater. There's a whole bunch of Hollywood icons, but they're miles apart or blocks apart. So I just kind of took the license and I squeezed everything. So if you watch that movie, you'll see a lot of buildings that are blocks apart in Hollywood but I squeeze them so they could be in the one shot. You'll see all kinds of buildings. Some are on High Island and some are like on Vine, but they're all like in this one block here. And I put this one theater, the, um, the Warner Theater, you can tell it has these little, uh, little, actually they were large radio towers. And I thought it was very funny when we did the shot to use them as goalposts. So I actually had them bring the camera down across here, pull through these, these two, two uh, radio towers and then down the building and it blends into the casual theater for the opening shot of the movie. Lightning flashes is when they do the blend. And uh, this is another angle of the same thing. Oh, this might be the goofy one. That's it. This is, this is the model from the opening of the movie. And then actually in the movie, Ed Wood does a model of Hollywood. And it had to be bad enough that it didn't look good, but it couldn't be so bad that it was too jokey and unbelievable. So we did this one. This is where they're, they're lighting the paper plates on fire, dangled from fishing rods. and. Um, uh, it was, it, was, it was actually tougher to do this model than this one because I can say just make it perfect. And this one is like, you can't make it, it can't be too bad. It, it, it was, it was a, you had to find the fine line between being bad and good. I'd seen um, Plan 9 from Outer Space and I'd seen Brian the Monster. I'd never seen Glenn or Glenda. And I didn't really know. I knew he was like considered not a great director, but I didn't know. I mean, now I know all about him and, and like that. And it's, it's a much deeper story than, you know, back, back when I didn't know anything about him. But, uh, um, yeah, I learned everything there is to know. I, I know all his movies now, just about everything you can know about uh, you know, Ed Wood. One thing I talked to Tim about, he wanted to do the sets that had to do with the movies. But he wanted to make them as much like those as possible. So I just studied those things and tried to figure out what made those sets unique. One thing they had that was really unique is flatness. There was no depth to the sets. They were flat. The paint was flat. There wasn't like reflections and depth and glazes. It was flat paint. And, and the colors had a certain contrast. This is from um, uh, Bride of the Monster. The, the two girls meet in the, in the hallway. And basically, you can see this is, this is myself down here. I don't know if you can see it. It's um, showing that black and white are the same thing, trying to match the flatness and the contrast of the, the original set. I would uh, take take black and white pictures of everything. And here's the actual green and uh, the two colors that I used. I just, I'm partial to green since uh, I've done a lot of movies with a lot of green in them. And uh, I figured that it looked nice on the set to the eye and it had the same contrast values as the original. 
So that's how we kind of did it. We went through scene by scene here. Here's a scene, here's a scene from the uh, I Have No Home scene with Bella. And this is the wallpaper and the flooring that we found. This is from uh, Secondhand Rose in New York. We searched all over for to get as close to the feeling of the textures and, and uh, values of what was in the original film. Uh, we searched around. We looked all over LA. You, we ended up with a, a company in New York. They're famous for their old wallpapers. And we had a, the uh, uh, little privacy screen there. We ha they had it hand done, and, and uh, uh, muralist actually painted the little flowers on there. See, this is what I also put in the books. Um, I put uh, sketches and drawings of all the sets. Here's a set of a camera store that wasn't in the movie. It was a nice looking little set where Ed Wood goes to try to get some camera equipment, and the guy won't loan it to him because he owes him money. And, but I believe this set was left out of the left out of the film. But that shows you that the colors you use. Yeah, though. this shows I did using. I didn't do the movie in black and white. I did it in color, and uh, I used like old style '50s graphics, made up Highland camera. It was supposed to be Hollywood, and everybody knows Highland sort of in Hollywood, so I picked that as the name. And uh, we, had, we had a little thing in here. We had an actor at a counter, and it was a good looking little set, but you know, it didn't make it. Too much shoe leather, I guess. These are actually one of the theaters that we did do. We, you know, we, everything was simple and graphic. There wasn't a lot of, you know, the texture stuff. It was graphic, simple. The poster. This is the, the one I did. It was originally, the real movie was called Glenn or Glenda, and I had to change a bunch of stuff the night before. And I even put wallpaper. This one is where um, Bella is doing his first scene, and he gets incensed that, that uh, someone compares him to um, uh, Boris Karloff, and he, he goes off on Boris Karloff. This uh, is from one of the, the apartment sets that Johnny lived in. This is from the I have no home scene that I, I showed you previously. And this is from the scene where John's, uh, uh, Johnny Depp's is sitting on a couch reading, and he has this thinking about in Glen or Glenda when he thinks about wearing women's clothes. This is a, this is a very close match to the, the original wall. And we, again, we photograph everything in black and white first. I have to be sure that there's, if, for, for instance, this red blended into the gray and it looked gray, I'd have to come in and I would have to have the painters brighten it up. But uh, this wallpaper worked fine because uh, the, the, there's a lot of chroma in that red. It's really a bright red. A duller red, like a, 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 like a more earthy red, might have a tendency to blend into gray and I might have to f uh, touch up a little bit. I used a lot of vinyls and linoleums that tried to give it the 50s period. And we had one scene where uh, Sarah Jessica Parker and Johnny had a scene in a, in a kitchen, a 50s kitchen. And uh, it was fun to make the little kitchen, but in the research I saw this really cool floor that they had and I wanted to do a really cool floor for our set. Well, we looked and we couldn't find any of that really cool linoleum, although I did come across a linoleum rug at Secondhand Rose in New York, and it was really expensive. I think it was $4,500 or something for a 9 by 12 rug. It's just, it's just a piece of loose linoleum, and it's really beautiful little, little borders and stuff on it, and I just had to have it. It, was just, it made that set. It was really a beautiful thing. You really only see it a little bit in the movie, but it really finished the set. You walk in, and you saw this cute little 50s uh, streamlined kind of set with this great linoleum floor, and, and I was happy. It was a lot of money for it, and, and it got, I know it got ruined. Los no. This was the uh, carnival from Ed Wood, and there's a color shot. In the, this is the black and white. This is how it could have looked in the movie. Um, this is up in like near, near Eagle Rock, near a big power plant. And I like we just had this. It was kind of cheesy. You know, the bulbs are burned out. But you just kind of just did it so you get to see the ver the light versus dark contrast thing that's so important in black and white. So Tim wanted to do a fun house, and he has a certain graphic imagination that he wanted. He wanted these graphic images on the front of this. Fun house, and, and uh, we talked a lot about it, and then we did a bunch of series of sketches, and this is what was what came up with, and we had a um, scenic artist, Ron Strang, painted up on tin because the concept behind the whole fun house was like it was a, a trailer uh, pulled behind a, a semi truck, you know, and, and they could just unfold it into this fun house and and drive the little car around inside, like like, like a typical carny show. Some shots of the spook house. These are the, the color shots, and there's the black and white shots, night shots. Everything's underlit, the glowing skull. Very wispy, scary stuff. These are Polaroids. These are color Polaroids of the uh, Funhouse ride and the skull. These are actually color because this, these weren't, it wasn't a paint job here, but this, you can see it's an Edvard Munch kind of face. Tim is very partial to Edvard Munch, and I thought it'd be funny to have a little ghostly Edvard Munch face on the uh, Funhouse. These are some of the graphics for the front of the Spook House. A little bit uh, different from what was inside. Yeah, these are a little bit more erotic than you might picture for a 
typical Kearney uh, funhouse ride. And then we just developed a whole series of little kind of uh, funhouse gags that were really simple and, and kind of, again, naive in their style. I mean, we had skeleton arms trying to grab you as you came through. Then the, the coffin opens and a Dracula character comes out and bats fly around in circles. Really simply done. We had uh, skeleton heads with little uh, was uh, wispy um, um, diaphanous fabric kind of pop up and uh, a little, with a little light gag. We had a gorilla kind of bouncing up and down. Uh, beyond, we had, the, which was my favorite one, we had the Grim Reaper with a with this reaper just kind of coming right over your head. Johnny just kind of ducks and doesn't really know what it is. A, a spike door closes, they go by, and they, they stall right in front of the guillotine with the bobbing heads. And that's when he tells um, uh, Patricia Arquette that he likes to wear women's clothes, and she's okay about it. And here's you know, some of the bobbing head sketches. I forget which ones we actually ended up with. Some of the Dracula heads. We didn't do that one. For the uh, and these are actually some of the, the the foam models that we ended up with for the uh, fun house. The inside, I we were running out of money at the end of the movie, and so they, they didn't want to spend a lot of money in the fun house. So I wanted to do a campy '50s, again naive uh, design uh, fun house. So what I did, I took all the leftover sets from the movie that uh, uh, the wall pieces, and want to cut them in all odd shapes, influenced by an episode of uh, Twilight Zone that Tim liked and uh, I sprayed a really heavy texture that I used on Batman Returns, sprayed all over the walls, drippy, gooey plaster, and then we painted it black and burnished it in silver to bring out the, the texture. And I just kind of set it all weird angles, so as, as the little car would go through, you'd have all these weird angles and lighting opportunities. It's, it's German expressionism, okay? Angles, very strong angles, very strong lighting pattern shadows, very dark, uh, like film noir, but like German expressionist. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very popular. Tim loves that stuff, and... and We've done it several times with them. It's 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 really good stuff. I always look for some concept. That's one thing. Uh, and Bo Welch and I work together. He always comes up with great concepts for movies and little things and jokes and background things that give it uh, you know a different level. You know, there's different levels in movies. The obvious plot and subplots and the other little things in the background that just give it a little bit more than just filming a set. And in this movie, flying saucers were a re recurring image. So I tried to have some image of a flying saucer in every set. Everything's a big round disc flying over everyone's head. And that was a little little homage to the flying saucer craze of the 50s that I threw in there that some people picked it up. You know, It was one of those little fun things to do. It's a little behind the scenes kind of joke you throw into movies. This is the ultimate Ed Wood movie. No compromises. He had a certain naive style that I, it's, it's really refreshing. Now everything is kind of overproduced and over massaged digitally. He had a really fresh way of doing a movie. Set the camera up, shoot, move on. You know, that, that scene where they're, they're rolling on the Hollywood street and the cops show up, whoop, you know, they gotta go, you know, that's kind of, it's like the dogma style nowadays, you know, just go and shoot it and no, no, f you know, $20 million of digital work and overproduced. Cue flying saucer. And there's something refreshing about that. It gives it a look, you know, but uh, uh, I find it a humorous look. It's different, definitely different. Cut, Brent, we're moving on. That was perfect. Perfect.